After I have spent some time discussing the Triconics attack in the last video, let's focus on the 2015 cyber attack in Ukraine. The attack is noteworthy because it was the first successful cyber attack against critical infrastructure, in this case electrical power distribution for parts of Ukraine. As a result of the attack, around 200,000 people lost electricity for several hours. Let's briefly break down the major attack characteristics. And I'm only giving you the helicopter view here. If you are interested in more detail, please refer to the links that I have put in the description. The infiltration was accomplished by a spear phishing campaign using a Microsoft Office document with malicious macros. Successfully compromised Windows machines in three electrical distribution control centers called out to command and control servers. This allowed the attackers to gain a foothold in the IT networks of the control centers. There they managed to harvest access credentials that were then used to hop over to the SCADA networks where they installed malware. Among the harvested credentials were those for remote access to the SCADA systems. These were then used to remotely log on and shut down power by opening circuit breakers in dialogue mode, not malware initiated. In other words, a rogue electrical engineer was sitting on the other end of the VP tunnel, manually shutting down everything in the substations. At the same time, access credentials for local control room staff were changed so that they could only watch disaster unfold without being able to react. In order to complicate recovery, the attackers then uploaded corrupt firmware on serial to Ethernet gateways in the substations. The rogue firmware did nothing else but brick the gateways, making them unresponsive. As a result of the malfunctioning gateways, the breakers could no longer be closed remotely in the event that control room staff had finally managed to regain access to their SCADA systems. The utility had to send out repair personnel to the unmanned substations. The SCADA systems in the control centers were taken down by a wiper malware, so that they would need to be restored from backups. However, as a result of the power shutdown, the control centers found themselves without electrical power. As the icing on the cake, the attackers had disabled the uninterruptible power supplies in the control centers. In other words, the victim suffered a complete clusterfuck. As a side aspect here, it is interesting to note how much better the attackers in this incident were prepared when compared to the forces behind the Triconex attack. These guys were surely not messing around. So what do we learn from this? If you have followed the fallout from this attack in the media, on conference floors, in webinars and research papers, I take it that you have heard a lot about Black Energy, Kill Disk, the Sandworm team, the cyber kill chain, cyber operators from Russia and so forth. You can even learn about in the internal architecture of the malware and specific exploits. What you haven't heard is the only thing of direct practical value. And that is the question, what would have prevented this attack from happening? Just think about it. Why would you bother examining tools, tactics and procedures before understanding the most important aspect of the whole story, which is how could this have been prevented? This is what we'll do right here. First we got the spear phishing. Surprise! Spear phishing is by far the most widely used tactic for initial infiltration. I vividly remember talking to an international group of C-level executives from the energy industry a couple of years ago. When I briefly mentioned spear phishing and its importance, I noticed a blank stare on many faces. So I asked, who of you knows what spear phishing is? Only one or two hands were raised. After explaining the term, one of them said, wait, we actually had this phenomenon just recently. And as you will probably guess, they certainly had opened the compromised attachment and had gotten infected. Long story short, spear phishing is so common these days 
particularly in the context of ransomware, that you have to establish defensive mechanisms, of which there are several. It's not rocket science, and it is an absolute necessity. Like I told those energy executives, this single topic alone has made it worth for you to fly here and attend this workshop. Second, we have improper network segregation between the IT network and the SCADA network. Once that the attackers had access credentials, they could zip right through the firewall and drop malware on the SCADA systems, in this case a wiper. It is unclear what the use case for direct access from the IT network to SCADA stations would be, if there was one. The obvious remedy would have been either total separation of both networks, a data diet, or implementation of a DMZ. A simple firewall is definitely not good enough if your SCADA systems control anything of critical value, as in this case. Third, we have remote operator access capability to manned control centers. This is something that I struggle to understand, because again, what's the use case? There is an obvious app use case, and we have seen it in action here. But why in the world would you allow for an external party to manipulate a process and sidelining local operators? That just doesn't make sense to me. But even if we assume that there was an operational necessity for remote operation, there are lots of ways how to fully control remote access from a security perspective, ranging from two-factor authentication to rendezvous architectures that require active session enabling by local staff. Fail to secure your remote access points properly and suffer the consequences. Fourth, we have missing network security controls for serial to Ethernet gateways. The attack vector used, which is bricking these devices using corrupt firmware images, is well known in the OT security community. It was circulated back in 2008 by the US Department of Homeland Security, dubbed the Boreas vulnerability. Protection against this well-known attack vector would have required a firewall or a simple access control list that blocks the TCP port that is used for firmware uploads to the gateways, which is different from the port used for online communication with the serial devices. In other words, simple thing to do. I am even inclined to bet that Ukrainian maintenance staff never updated the firmware of the gateways anyway, so why have this capability in the first place? Fifth, when you are operating anything of importance, you will not connect your uninterruptible power supplies to the network, because then they would no longer be uninterruptible. Simply for convenience, UPS vendors have added the functionality to control UPS operation via the network, including the option to shut the UPS down. So you can simply launch the vendor's app, press a button and do as you please from your comfy chair, rather than walk down to the room where the UPSs are running. That's a high price for convenience. Here's the bottom line. The security posture of this utility had so many holes that it would make a strong case for negligence. I know what you're going to say. It's easy to point all this out in hindsight. But that's wrong, plain and simple. It's wrong. All the shortcomings that I have pointed out are well known for many years to every OT security consultant worth his or her salt. They would have been pointed out in a reasonable OT security assessment if the utility had bothered to do one. So, let's put it on the table. What's the most important lesson from the Ukrainian cyber attack? Is it A. That you have to keep a close eye on the Sandburn team and on the APT this and the APT that and that you have to watch for their TTPs and IOCs in your networks? Or is it B, 
that you have a realistic chance to prevent cyber physical attacks even by nation state players by implementing well organized cybersecurity controls and maybe investigate the threat landscape after you have established a baseline cybersecurity capability. Today, more than ever, prevention is not difficult to achieve in OT. It is within reach for any OT asset owner. Unlike years ago, today there is no shortage of competent OT security consultants, ranging from one-man shows to the big five consultancies. And by the way, never discount the one-man shows or smaller consultancies in general, because they often bring superior experience and dedication to the table. Add to that the fact that today you can enjoy unprecedented visibility of your OT networks and security posture. OT asset management software informs you and your consultants in detail on network topology, data flow, installed software, known vulnerabilities, and much more. As a result, OT security assessments are not only much more accurate than ever before, because no guesswork is needed to identify vulnerabilities and attack vectors. They can also be finished much quicker, because no walkdown inspections are required to map and understand the installed base in all its complexity. So that is, in my opinion, the most important lesson from the Ukraine attack. Let me know what you think in the comments below and please share this video so that we can have a broad discussion.